Today's episode of Socially Democratic is presented to you by Dunn Street. Dunn Street partners with businesses, organisations, unions and social democratic parties across the globe to train leaders, develop engagement strategies and empower people to organise for change. And in 2020, Dunn Street will continue to work with folks that want to make a difference, inspire, give hope and enable leadership to achieve their shared purpose. To find out how you can partner with Dunn Street, hit us up at dunnstreet.com.au. Hello and welcome to episode 60 of Socially Democratic, your weekly centre-left political and cultural podcast that dives into the progressive issues of the day and the people leading them from home and abroad. And abroad we go again, as you would have noticed on our socials this week, it's 19 days till the election day in the United States and we've lined up um, a number of US-based guests to take us into the final weeks of the campaign starting with today uh, we're going to be joined by katie parsons who um, in a former life was a part of the obama alumni she was a field organizer in 2008 and the regional get out the vote director in 2008 and uh, now works for a major democratic campaign consultancy firm in uh, in chicago but she's going to join us on the podcast today to talk about uh, the ground game for the Democrats, um, field, field organising, direct voter contact, canvassing, phone banks, door knocks, volunteer uh, mobilisation, organisation, all that kind of stuff. So for all of the um, field nerds out there that listen to the podcast, this is the episode for you. Don't forget, we've also got uh, next week, uh, Ross morales Raquetta, who's the co-founder of Run For Something, uh, which is a really, really interesting organisation that was created out of the nightmare that was the election of Donald Trump in 2016 and it is an organisation that is designed to encourage, enable um, and uh, support young progressives that want to put their hand up and run for public office in down ballot races. And so Ross is going to come on next week and talk about the work that they have done um, in the lead up to the 2020 general uh, we're also then going to have in the final week of the campaign we're bringing our buddy um, sam schneiben back on and he will be joined with katie conley who we had on a couple of weeks ago as well and together we're just going to just get ready mentally emotionally for the uh the run into election day and hopefully work out how and where we need to watch to watch um, Biden and Harris take back the White House and hopefully Democrats win the Senate and a whole bunch of other races as well. So lots of uh, US-based content coming up for you on Socially Democratic. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast using uh, your favorite podcast app, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and now on Amazon and or just you use your favorite podcast app. Um, did I just say that? I think I did. Um, and also, if you're using Apple Podcasts, please give us a rating and leave us a review. We'd really, really appreciate that. And for all the updates, follow Dunn Street on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Let's get to today's episode. We're taping this one on a Friday morning in lockdown Melbourne. It's 19 days to go until election day in the US. Uh, and joining us on the line from uh, Chicago is a former Obama for America regional uh, get out the vote director and she now works uh, for a democratic consultancy. Uh, Katie Parsons, welcome to Socially Democratic. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me on. Great to talk to you. I, uh, I haven't had my coffee this morning, so I'm a little bit... Um, I need to, you know, get with it. Now, the uh, the interesting thing about following US politics from Australia is, is that um, for a lot of us, myself included, I wake up every morning and I grab my phone and I check either Twitter or the New York Times to see what crazy shit has happened overnight in America. Um, whereas you see it unfold live every day. Is it just me or since the passing of uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg that the events have just got crazier and crazier and crazier each day? Like what is going on right now? Yeah, yeah, it's, um, it's completely impossible to keep track of what the current 
crisis is. Um, I, you know, watch a lot of like um, sort of weekend comedy shows, both here and and from elsewhere. And it was really funny to watch um, at the end of that week where we had um, funeral debate, Trump getting sick, and what do we even make jokes about? And the debate became such distant news that that wasn't even a topic of conversation by the Saturday. So, yeah, it's um, definitely, definitely I have whiplash and I think most people do too. In amongst all of that whole, like the, the two or three days worth of um, articles that the New York Times had lined up in terms of Trump's taxes that they obviously had done a lot of research on for a long period of time, just kind of, and I think they would have timed it going, okay, we've got some clear air now, <laughs> let's, let's release all of this. And it just got yeah. completely lost in, you know, the insanity. Absolutely. And it's not the first time. I'm trying to remember the last big um, sort of research dump that the Times did maybe a year ago. And it was the exact same thing. You know, clearly... It's it's so nice to see investigative journalism like actually turn something up and you get this kind of news that we're all craving. And, um, yeah, there's just not the, the space to actually air it out completely. But there also just there wasn't there wasn't very much that was completely surprising mm. about about that. It was just really satisfying to actually have some numbers and, you know, know that that. Trump had to to read those headlines. <laughs> yeah, which no doubt would have absolutely driven um, spare. Now, we've got you on today to talk, um, obviously, about the campaign, but in particular, uh, a, a topic that's close to both your and my heart, which is um, field, because it's our background. But before we dive into that, um, tell us a bit about your entry into uh, democratic campaigns and democratic politics. How did you start? Yeah, um, it was not planned, <laughs> which I think, I think actually is is fairly typical of of some of the Obama alum who got in um, just just to kind of see what's going on. So I had been in in from 2004 to 2007. I was teaching English in Japan, so I had just come back um, to the to the states from from that and had some like part time jobs and very unfulfilling. Um, work. And I remembered, let's say December of, of 2007, I remembered this friend of mine in college um, talking about she had gone out to volunteer for um, for the Democrats in, in 2004. And this was not a thing that I had done or kind of, you know, knew anything about, but she had this incredible experience. And um, I was like, oh, well, you know, I know somebody in Iowa. Um, I'm really sick of the work that I'm doing. Maybe I should go check that out and see what it's about. And I wasn't even necessarily a full Obama convert at that point. I really liked Obama, but I liked um, Bill Richardson and, you know, like a couple of the other candidates who were running and on a complete whim signed up on a bunch of websites, you know, late at night, one night, just, okay, somebody give me something interesting to do. And I don't think anybody else got back to me, but the Obama campaign, they called me the next day, you know, um, perfect example of of following up on those hot leads right um called me the next day and said great you know what can you do can you get out of here all this and um within a couple of days i think right after christmas i i drove out there and slept on my friend's couch and had this incredible uh organizer who's working out there um matt larock who he was the organizer in grinnell iowa and just you know this was the first time i'd experienced canvassing and there is no better place to start as an organizer than the primaries in Iowa because these people really care and really want to have conversations with you um and it's just a it's a really cool experience so I did it I loved it and I just wanted to keep doing it so for the for the next couple of um of primary races I drove out to Missouri, I drove out to Ohio just as a volunteer. And then when the when the campaign came around to Indiana, which is where I was living, all these people were burnt out. You know, had organizers who'd been on the ground for, for a year. And it, it, it used to be right before 2008, you know, at least for a long time, everything was over by Super Tuesday, mm-hmm. by March. So these organizers that we were, to, we were getting into April and May, they hadn't had a break bunch of people were starting to to take some time off and so they started hiring organizers again and that's really 
that's how I got onto the campaign. And then I just carried on from there. Uh, where did they, as a field organizer, where did they first send you? So I was in Iowa or in, in Indiana first yep. um, at, at home, uh, kind of, you know, I, I did move to another town in Indiana, so I wasn't staying at home because they needed um, me somewhere else. And then I went to South Dakota for the primary there, and then that was kind of the end of the primary cycle. And then I was in Las Vegas for, for the general election. Now you're in Nevada. In Nevada. Um, yeah, Nevada. Um, can you think of a sort of a sem- – I, I, I do love speaking to uh, Obama alumni um, about the 20 20- – uh, the 2008 and 2012 campaigns. And I feel like in years time, you know, when you watch sort of political documentaries about the Clintons or um, sort of 1990s, early 2000s documentaries, and there's a lot of older people who um, I guess we'll all refer to them as boomers, will all re- re- think back to um, the, the moment they first got engaged in politics or democratic politics was because of Bobby Kennedy. You know, it's this, it's the throw, throw it's the throwback line. Oh, I haven't I haven't seen this enthusiasm since Bobby Kennedy. You know, I think the Obama generation is going to be the next you know yardstick. I think in 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 moments in American democratic politics where people actually step forward, not John Kerry or or, or you know a bunch of other guys. It's clearly Obama, right? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, certainly, anybody. Um you know, who would, who would be considered a millennial. That's true so far. I, I definitely think that there will be some people who were really newly engaged this, this time around by a couple of the candidates, um, but not to the same mass scale. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely Obama. Um, so can you think of a seminal moment um, in your time as a field organizer that stands out for you that sort of describes, you know, why you got involved or, or, or what, what organizing means to you? Yeah, it's it's hard to point out one specific moment. It, it it was really the collection of all of the conversations that that I had with individual voters. It was just really the first time I'd had that kind of experience, you know, and driving around, you're working as an organizer in all different types of communities and different places across the country and that that opportunity to have an interaction with all of these different kinds of people was really was really what um, what kept me going, but I, I, you know, I was trying to think of of an example um, that really encapsulates things. So in 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 Anderson, Indiana, which is the first place where I was on staff, it's a really interesting community. It's kind of a mid-sized town in Indiana that um, is definitely emblematic of Rust Belt. They used to have a lot of um, car manufacturing or car parts manufacturing companies um, uh, factories there. And so there's a there's a sizable black community in that town, um, which is slightly unusual considering how small it is and where it is. Um, and so there's just this like really passionate group of people who were very very excited to support Obama in the primaries. Um, and but then you also had sort of the the broader white community of Democrats who were who were starting to get engaged. And there was um, my my sort of fabulous um, key volunteer in in my office, the office manager, was an older black woman who, um, you know, the night before election night when we were going to have our watch party, she kind of said to me, Katie, you know, I don't know if I want to go to this party because there, there are just people who, you know, I'm not super familiar with and never – never spent time with them and I'm not sure I would be comfortable. I was just like, please, please, please come. I think, you know, you, this is, this is the community where everybody is excited to be here. We are all, we are all here for Obama. And she came and um, at the end of the night came up and, and just said, you know, this is, this is the first time I've ever had an experience like this where I was really interacting with um, sort of the broader Anderson community and felt totally comfortable. And it's just, I never thought I would see this in my life. Uh, and I think that was there were a lot of moments like that um, in 2007 and eight for a lot of people. And it was just really exciting. I think journalists that cover political campaigns be it in the United States or anywhere else, and this has been my experience in Australia, is that they think that campaigns are all completely transactional. Um, and that we're all politicians and we're all ruthless and it's all about votes. And I think that they miss 
these moments and if you describe them they're not interested in it like it's sort of oh, i don't want to i don't want to write about that anyway you know what is this i'm not a you know i'm not a puff piece journalist i'm hard hitting but this this is such an important component of community organizing or electoral organizing is that those those moments where you bring people together um and the cynics out there just don't don't see it or don't want to believe it that it happens but it happens all the time and it's the as we talk about it, it's the glue that binds our movement together it's so it's so important it is, it is. And it's so funny you, you mentioned that because I think first, one of the, one of the things that I had to first learn when I first started organizing is that cynicism does not work, not, not for an organizer. Right. And I'm a, I'm actually a pretty sarcastic, cynical person. And that is really effective if you're a pundit or, um, you know, mostly focused on, on strategy. Um, it, it, doesn't work when you're standing up in front of a crowd of a hundred people and trying to inspire them to, you know, make 200 phone calls. Um, you really have to cut that out of your vocabulary. Uh, and it's, it's actually been really great <laughs> to have more experiences where, um, where I'm forced to not be cynical. Yeah. So let's, uh, let's turn to um, contemporary campaign politics. Um, and I, I, uh, I want to talk. I, I, I want to sort of unpack the the field operation that's going on um, right now. But before we do, I sort of kind of want to go back a little bit. Um, Twelve this time last year, twelve months ago, I was in DC. I took a delegation of Australians over um, to DC and to New York, and we met with folks from the DNC who were in the sort of those foundation stages of setting up the Organizing Core 2020, um, which is sort of the Democratic party's sort of field operation um and i want you to talk a bit more about that in a moment um because you you played an important role in setting that up for us but before we do can we just go back four years and talk about the hillary campaign um because i've read a lot of articles that have reviewed that campaign and one of the criticisms that came in was that there wasn't any organizing being done by the hillary campaign in 2016 um now that's a surprise to me because I was over in 2016. You know, I canvassed in North Carolina and Virginia and Pennsylvania. I made calls into Pennsylvania for, from Brooklyn uh, on election day. Um, <laughs> let's not go back there again. Um, it, it appeared to me that there was a field operation going on. I met some very enthusiastic young field organisers across the country. Um, but Tom Perez, the DNC uh, chairman, had in, I've read a couple of articles where he said that we didn't have a field program in 2016. What what's your read on that? No, I think you're absolutely right. Of course, there was there was a field campaign and there was an organizing effort in 2016. Um, could some things have been done differently or resources been deployed in different places? Clearly, <laughs> um, or or we wouldn't be where we are. But I, but I I think you absolutely cannot blame a loss in 2016 on a field organizing program or a lack of one that is is simply not the case field organizing has started to become a professionalized career um really only in the last 10 years or so you know we can thank citizens united for all of the money that are in politics and um sort of ecosystem that that creates for a whole new industry essentially but it used to be that anybody who's a field organizer, it was, it was just like being um, kind of like being a, a Hill intern, right? It was, a, it was an opportunity that really only kind of the most privileged people had access to because it, it requires incredible amounts of time. Um, you're paid very little, if any at all. You often have to kind of, you have to rely on your own resources to get around and to find places to stay and things like that. So it's really people who are in a, in a comfortable position who can, who can experience that. Um, and that is, has been true even, even up to more recently, just because it's not, um, it, it's not that well paid. So I think what we found um, the, the people who were behind putting together organizing court. And actually I, I had nothing to do with that. Meg and Sarah, who's one of the um, founding partners of 270 Strategies was heavily involved with that. So certainly I heard about the program through, through her work, um, but, but I wasn't directly involved. But really what they saw is, okay, we know we are coming up um, 
to the election. We've got these battleground states, and in particular, we have some fairly large metropolises in those battleground states. We need a lot of organizers. We need them to be trained, and we need them to be representative of their communities, of the communities who we are trying to reach. We know in organizing that the person who is best placed um, to, to organize a community is somebody from that community. So the, the organizing core was really an effort to recruit young people who were representative of their community, whatever, whatever that looked like, um, get them into a program to get trained so that they would be ready to go um, and also to pay them during that training and to give them paid experience. So um, it was definitely a massive effort to get more capacity on the ground. I don't think it was because there was a lack of capacity in 2016. It was just looking at, okay, we know we're going to need more people in these places. So let's, let's go there. So, and also is it worth acknowledging or, or, or understanding the, the history of the, how campaigns have operated pre previously, because in 2008 and 2012, um, Obama for America that just sort of went on to become, you know, organizing for action. That was his operation. They were his field organizers um, and his field program. It wasn't the Democratic Party's operation. Correct. Um, is, is this a deliberate move by the DNC to say, right, well, we need to actually skill up our own people and not have to rely on the presidential ticket of who the, whoever that may be to, to, um, to pull those staffing resources together? Yeah, I think it's, I think that's definitely part of it. It's also knowing that you have the, you have the primaries where you've got many different candidates and we knew going in, there would be lots of candidates, right? We knew quite early um, that we would be looking at many more candidates than we'd had in a long time. So you have um, lots of very small campaigns, relatively small campaigns, rather than one or two massive campaigns going into the primaries. When you go from the primary cycle where you're kind of going state to state, maybe you have, you know, depending on your budget, anywhere from one to 10 massive field operations, maybe you have more, but um, to then going to having a general election candidate, right? You've got your nominee where we really need to scale up in a big way in 15 states or more. Um, so it's, it's also just a scaling problem. We knew that the eventual party nominee would need a massive scale operation. So let's build that, not waiting for all of these other little campaigns to catch up. Um, and certainly, I mean, you're you're seeing huge numbers of people who were involved with the primary campaigns who are who make up the backbone of of the of Biden's team. But um, you just need even more people than that can generate. And thinking about that, so it's sort of late February uh, this year and the DNC's field program, the organising core, would be in that sort of pre preparation stage of, you know, we're kind of getting to the midway point or um, at some stage the, the, the primary season would wrap up and then that infrastructure would then move in to support the, the eventual nominee in June, July. Um, then COVID hits mid-March. Um what uh, what do you know? What kind of conversations were going on within the party at that point in time? Like, shit, what do we do? Like, because it obviously was impacting the primaries, the primary campaigns as well. Like, there were you mentioned before that some primary campaigns had some pretty robust field operations, and yeah. it was incumbent on them for that was part of their strategy to win, right? Like Bernie has always talked about, and his our revolution pro program is a huge field operation. Um, yeah. What's your insights on that? How did they how did they overcome these challenges? And what do we what did we learn yeah. from that going into the general? Yeah. So so actually it's funny because March feels like a million years ago, but actually It was a million years ago. Right, right, right. It um the trajectory of the race was already clear by the time COVID started to have a serious impact uh in the US, right? Which was essentially March 10, 11, 12 is when everybody, everybody started to realize this is gonna hit home for us and in a big way. Um, it's not just something we're watching unfold mm. elsewhere, right? Um, but by that point in March, 
we were really, even though there were still a handful of candidates in the race, we were really down to um, Biden, Biden and Bernie. Um, so in, in some ways, I don't think that the primary campaigns developed these, in, these incredible responses to, to COVID. I think the primary campaigns already had developed some really interesting technology or ways of operating um, that happened to be very helpful. Now we are finding, and I kind of think that's that's a point worth belaboring because organizing during COVID, from what we've seen, really is just good organizing. It's not that there are necessarily these brand new innovations. Certainly there are some tools and technology that help us do that work better, but good organizing is good organizing. And, you know, we've, we've seen um, relational organizing really take off as something that we're relying upon. That was developed, um, well, some of those things were starting to be de developed several years ago, but but both the um, the Warren campaign, the the Buttigieg campaign, several of the campaigns had really invested in those operations even before COVID. Um, we see the integration, really intense integration between digital and grassroots work. Um, that's something we've been talking about since since 2012, uh, right? Like we we have always known that that needed to be done better. Now we are forced to do it uh, because there is no other way to, to reach people. But um, so I think the, the lessons that we learned are more just let's take what we've learned about great organizing from the primaries and apply that in, in this new context. You mentioned a word that I might get you to just uh, unpack that a bit for the folks at home, relational organizing. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, it's funny because it, it kind of drives me crazy that, that we're acting like this is some brand new thing. <laughs> it's just organizing, right? Yeah. Um, but but in the U.S. context, um, there are a couple of things that make it a little bit different and new. Um, so anyway, relational organizing, what does it mean? Uh, you know, in, in the old times, if you're a volunteer, you walk into a campaign office and your organizer hands you, you know, a, a list, of, a call sheet and ask you to call this batch of strangers and have conversation, conversations with them. Um, relational organizing says instead, okay, you're a volunteer, you walk in, or now we're doing this all digitally, um, but okay, think through your personal network. You volunteer, um, think of the 20 people you know best uh, and, and feel like you have a closest relationship with and could you know, have an impactful conversation with. Um, write down those names and okay, which of, which of those people already support Joe Biden, are big fans, they're enthusiastic, you think they might volunteer. Great. Call those five people, ask them to sign up and, and make some calls with you. Okay, think about who's the next five group of people who um, are kind of apathetic, like you think they probably are um, aligned with you and values, they probably support Joe Biden, um, but maybe they don't care that much maybe they haven't registered maybe you think they're not going to turn out okay send them a text message make sure that they have have registered to vote or they've signed up for their absentee ballot do that great okay and then the you know the last group certainly the hardest is think about those people who maybe you think you could persuade um probably they're not going to be uh hardcore trump supporters don't waste your time but if you've got some people who you think um, you know, they're really worried about their grandparents' health or they're really frustrated that all the schools are closed or that we're having, you know, a real struggle to get um, kids back into school. And you think that this is, this is the kind of opportunity where you can get them to vote for Biden, call them up and have a conversation. Call your network and actualize those people however is best suited to them. Um, so we really... We haven't done a ton of that work in the U.S., certainly at a national level. Uh, I think partially because we have such good data. Um, we have access to the voter file, and there are essentially no restrictions on who we can contact. And so we're able to do a lot of modeling and, and look at a large population and say, who are the people we need to reach? And then let's deploy our volunteers based on priority to reach those different groups of people. Uh, I think, you know, 
in in smaller campaigns or outside the US actually these relational organizing tactics are are far more critical because you don't have a list to start with often or you're really restricted in who you can reach out to so i actually i don't know what the rules are in australia or is it more similar to to gdpr or more similar to the us do you know uh, more similar to the us the all the major political parties get the voter roll okay and are there any restrictions on how you can reach them none none oh that's that's sweet. That's they don't great. give us uh, the, the voter roll doesn't inc- include um, contact numbers, so it's up to political parties to pay um, private vendors and match the rolls with the numbers. Other than that, go, okay. go for your life. Awesome. Okay. Yeah, I've done a fair amount of work in Europe, where um, increasingly, you know, we're running into really, really big challenges just reaching people, and I think especially in that context relational organizing is really critical. Um, And in the U.S. this time, in this election, especially in sort of late spring, when COVID was new for us, the lockdown was new, we were all still navigating how we're dealing with this, no one was interested in having a political conversation Mm. about anything, right? Or consuming any political content. Um, So even just getting people to pay attention to a candidate or a, a, a race was, was challenging for the, a couple of weeks to months, let's say. And I think it was especially in those moments when we realized, <laughs> well, okay, nobody wants to talk about politics, but everybody's talking to their friends and family and like distant relatives who they've never talked to, you know, in the last 10 years, they're on Zoom, they're in house party, they're, they're talking to people. So the only way we're going to be able to reach people is to access those conversations and turn those into mobilization or persuasion conversations. I actually think that's not true anymore. Um, Black Lives Matter really regalvanized the whole country back into political conversation. And so, I mean, as you said, we all got whiplash. Everybody's talking about it constantly. Mm. Um, but it's still a really important way for us to reach people. Um, so in terms of the, uh, before we sort of change topic a little bit, in terms of the uh, the DNC's ground operation, because I'd read the other day that they have resumed um, canvassing, as you call it in the States, or door knocking as we refer to it here in Australia, um, in, in a very light operation um, it, at the start of the the month, start of October. However, the the Trump campaign has continued their direct voter contact efforts, certainly on the doors. Um, I think I read some stats the other day in Michigan by late August, the GOP had forty three thousand volunteers on the ground, covering all eighty three counties. Um, and in Florida, they claimed that they knocked on their millionth door this month. Um, and so when you read that, you start to freak out a little bit because you're thinking, oh, my God, what, you know, <laughs> what is happening? Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think for all of us, I'm finding this whole journey a roller coaster ride anyway because some days I'm like, oh, Trump, Trump's going to get his ass kicked and then other days I'm starting to freak out. So when I read things like that, I get a little bit depressed. Um, mm-hmm. But do you feel confident, though, that there are, as you said before in your remarks, that there, it's not just about knocking on doors. There are other ways in which we can reach out to voters um, and do both voter registration turnout, persuasion and turnout. And that the field operation that the, 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 the Democratic Party are running is out there, but it's just not seen necessarily on the doors. Yeah. Um, okay, so let me talk about the general and then the specific. So in general, a good campaign should do a little bit of everything within whatever your set of resources are, right? So I'm definitely not a person who says, oh, it's all TV or it's only about door knocking, right? You need to you need to reach voters however you can. And even with the best of modeling, um, you don't know how you're gonna reach any, any specific individual. You may have a guess about what are the things that are most likely, but you should be using every tool in the toolbox looking at your audiences and thinking about, okay, how are we going to reach the most people however we need to? Um, so first set that aside. Um, to this specific moment, 
<sighs> People are paying more attention, I think, I hope, um, to the phone calls that they're having, to the conversations they're having online, to social media content. I don't know that the things that we find in this race are necessarily going to apply always and forever in a different context. If we ever get back to, um, you know, air quote, normal life, um, I would still think we've got to go back to a heavier emphasis on knocking on doors and having face-to-face -face conversations, because those are just, those are the conversations that break through. I think, you know, it doesn't take a campaign expert. You think about interactions that you have in your own life, which are the, which are the interactions you remember best. It is almost undoubtedly going to be the interactions you have in person are most memorable. And then online, if it's truly interactive, a conversation, and then just stuff you consume online that's last. Um, I think that will continue to hold. But in this situation where we're just having fewer in-person interactions in general, uh, maybe that's upended a little bit. So I think we're going to see digital and other types of online tactics be more effective than usual this year. Um, but how much? Is it enough? I, I don't know. <laughs> so here's one area that I get depressed about, and this is uh, voter registration. Um, I, sent you, I, I sent you during the week an article, oh, an opinion piece. Yep. Um, when it's making the rounds. Yep. Yeah, okay, by uh, Thomas Edsall. Um, for those who haven't read it, basically it's suggesting that the, the Republicans have done a far better job at voter registration um, and therefore building their base, a larger base, in key battleground states, including Florida, um, Pennsylvania, North Carolina. Um, what's, what's your read on this? Yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's been getting a lot of attention that that article in particular, because sort of like you said, I think everybody's on this roller coaster of it feels like one day or one week, we are so far ahead, we are winning, there's no question. And then the next day or week or whatever the time frame is, oh my God, everything's burning, there's no way we're going to win. Um, and I think that, at least in, in my experience, that article has sort of been the, the, the tip over to the, oh God, everything's on fire again. Um, but But the truth is, None of that is news. Uh, we have known that the Trump campaign was focusing on reg registering and bringing in low propensity voters um, from certain backgrounds, um, honestly, since 2015, and that that's been their focus uh, throughout this year as well. It's a smart strategy. Mm. I mean, if you are behind and there's no way that you're going to persuade people to join your team, which we're definitely seeing that, um, you know, there aren't some mass of Democrats who are going to start to vote for, for Donald Trump. The only way that he can bring in new votes is to register the people who have been apathetic up until now, right, okay. um, who look like his supporters. Um, so I think we've known that that's the strategy, and we've known that this was going to be a really close race. Right. So even even when the polling has looked really uh, good for us, uh, I think you'll hear, you know, I, I listen to David Pluff's podcast as well. Um, he's been saying, you know, all summer, um, it's going to tighten. It's going to tighten. It's going to go back to, you know, those, those Republicans who are pretty disgusted by Trump and really don't like how he behaves. Um, they're going to hold their nose probably and, and come back home, as he says. Um, and we'll see that start to happen in the polls as we get closer. And I think that's what's happening. So uh, the registration is just a piece of that, right? They're going to have, the Republicans are going to have the same problem the Democrats do when we register low propensity voters. They still have to turn out those people. Um, and we will see if they do it. But I, I don't think that it gives them some unique or unforeseen advantage. I think it's just a... Uh, a um... It's a little voice in my head because I just do remember that one of the strengths of the Obama campaign in 08 and 12 was the voter registration component that expanded the, the, the base. It was, you know, it was just a, one of the many reasons why it was such a successful campaign. Yeah. And I remember in 2016 reading somewhere one day, uh, and I don't know at what stage it may have been, maybe it was in October, that 
the Trump campaign, then I'd seen an article about their numbers of registration, and I was like, "Ooh, ooh, that's not good." And then I was, then I went, I just just dismissed it. I went, ah, "No one's going to vote for him. The guy's insane. He's an he's a, he, he's insane. Like there's yeah. there's just like <laughs> there's no way that he's going to become the president of the United States. Like just don't worry about that." And then on an election right. election night, sitting in a bar in Williamsburg, I remember yeah. I remember that article. I was like, "Oh." fuck so it's it's just really started it's stuck with me and i just can't let it go so when i read that article during the week i was like oh no it's happening right. it's happening right. again right no totally but i also you know you gotta remember that registering voters is like it's a real strong suit of democrats so i think that the news here is that republicans who have really never spent any time doing this because their voters are typically just more engaged in general. It's not some, it's not a program they have needed to run. It is new that they are doing it, but it's not that we are not. Mm. Um, I think, I think Democrats have, have always been um, because it's, because it's been more critical to us um, have always been strong in registration and, and in voter ed- education, which is critical this year. So you mentioned turnout and that's what I want to turn to now, because that's where I do feel more comfortable uh, and when I read all the polls, like, I, and I'm, I, I don't even look at the national polls anymore. I just simply, I just look, I'm just, I'm focusing on every battleground state poll and just <laughs> watching them like a hawk. And at this point in time, and I know there's still a long way to go and a lot of things can happen between now and election day, but you know, states like Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Nevada, Florida, Biden has a clear lead in those state polls. Um, wider than the margin of error. And it, you're right, Pluff is right, they will tighten, obviously. And that's when we'll start mm-hmm. to white-knuckle ride this. Um, so it does really become, if the polls are right, it now becomes a matter of just turning these people out who have said, yes, I am going to vote for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Mm-hmm. Um, the turnout operation for the Democrats, how, what, what insights can you gather from that? How is that tracking? Obviously, early voting is having a huge impact because of, I'm assuming because of coronavirus and also mail-in ballots. Uh, what what's your read on all of this? How are we feeling about what we're seeing so far on the ground? Yeah, I think it's it's really exciting to see everybody really voting early. Truly, you know, we we set up the infrastructure for that to happen. I say we. I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> we all did. We all did. <laughs> it was done. Um, right for for you know expanding the vote so that more people can vote early in person also so that many more people can more easily vote by mail and people are taking advantage of it. Um, my dad who, who votes in Indiana um, sent me a picture. Um, he, he went and voted in person last week and um, this is like small town Indiana, which is a red state, right? Um, there was a line, not a very big one. It's a small town, but there was a line to, to vote early, um, which is just exciting regardless. Um <laughs> So how is it looking? Um, massive numbers. Actually, I'm, I don't know if you follow, I, I suspect you do, the um, U.S. Elections Project. This is uh, Michael McDonald's website has a really nice visualization and really good tracking of this. So I'm just looking at the, at the latest numbers, 17,000, or sorry, 17 million, uh, 800,000 votes turned in already, which is, 12.9 percent of the total 2016 <laughs> vote yes. three weeks out three weeks out it's, it's unbelievable um you know everybody else has already said the things that i think are true which is that democrats typically vote earlier i think we're seeing that both in the states where where they track those um actually who you know your registration when you when you turn in your ballot um that we are doing that um and it's just going to remain to be seen what it looks like as we get closer and closer to election day. But anecdotally, I constantly hear even people who had signed up to uh, register to vote by mail say, yeah, I registered, but but I actually I'm going to go in person. I know it's really critical that my that my ballot is counted and that it's in as early as possible. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to go do that in person, uh, which is really reassuring because, you know, the, the big question is, um, when are these votes going to be counted? 
and will Republicans dominate on election day, which are in many states, uh, the, the ballots that are first counted. So I think you're seeing people really respond to the information that they're getting, which is reassuring. Uh, and then, and then the campaign has a massive program to make sure that our supporters know how to vote, have a plan to vote. And if they've already voted in places where, um, where ballots are being rejected, this is happening in North Carolina, Georgia and Pennsylvania, um, right? We already have a, a huge effort to contact people to make sure that they go back and, and fix their ballot. However, that that's done in their state. So it's a big effort. The culture in Australia with voting is, as in the last decade has changed somewhat. We find that a lot of people are now early voting. Um, and I know it's fundamentally different to the United States in that th there are more opportunities and places to vote. We have more polling centres. But I think what happened was folks were getting sick and tired of queuing on Saturday, more elections on a Saturday. Uh, it's sick and tired of queuing on a Saturday morning when they've got to take their kids to sport and they've got to do shopping and whatnot. Um, so people would start early voting. And what we found is that when people started to find out you could early vote, more people started early voting. Therefore, there was queues now to go early vote um and it's in you know each electoral cycle it's increased the percentage of people who um, vote early either by mail or in person um in the queensland election that's coming up in a couple of weeks time they predict that upwards of 50 percent of the entire voting population will have early voted um mm. which is an ex which is a which i think is a result of COVID, but also a continual mm. cultural trend to vote early um that's so i never you know we sometimes as political strategists look at people voting early and thinking is that a good sign for us or is that a bad sign for us in australia i really don't think it matters i think it's more of a matter of convenience do we take any should we be in the united states right now should we be taking this as a sign of people wanting to get get there early and get rid of donald trump or is it just a matter of it's because of the impact that coronavirus has had on their communities that they're doing that now just to because it's safer yeah so how much of it is enthusiasm indicating more voters and how much of it is just i don't want to be around other people and so i'm getting it out of the way yeah i i think that we have lots of indicators that say it's certainly some enthusiasm um you know in in polling where we're asking people how enthusiastic are you to vote we're seeing huge numbers of enthusiasm um, certainly much more than in 2016. Um, and I think in the latest polling, and I'm, I'm sorry that I'm forgetting which poll it was that I was looking at that, that asked this, but, um, you know, much higher number of enthusiasm among Democrats, but still just general enthusiasm overall. Um, and that typically means more people will be, will be voting because that enthusiasm is contagious as long as they know how to vote. Um, I think the reason why it's good for Democrats, even if, let's say, 100% of these votes were purely out of convenience to get it done early. Um, it's still good for us because it means that more of the people who are sending in their ballots by mail or, or voting in person are doing that early so that we can catch any mistakes and we can fix those mistakes um, before the ballots are counted. Right. If if all of those people who were going to vote by mail sent in their ballot, you know, the day before Election Day. Very likely we wouldn't be able to cure all of the, the the mistakenly cast ballots. Right. So if they forgot a signature or didn't include their envelope or something like that, it just would be too late to fix all of them. So this gives us time to do that. It also means that the people who are most eager to vote who we don't need to spend time turning out have already gotten off the list, right? Because in a lot of states, those, those people are taken off of the call list. Um, so we can really focus on the people who do need more of a reminder and more education to make sure that they turn out. So they're getting it out of the way, which lets the campaign focus the resources more effectively. And I think that's, that's good for us too. I want to sort of broaden the conversation now a little bit more to sort of some of the theoretical aspects of organizing. Um, and so we can just get a organizing nerd hats on here. 
Um, I want to ask you a couple of questions in a moment about um, digital versus um, field. And you sort of spoke before about integration. I also want to talk to you about persuasion um, in, a, in an American context. But before we do that, um, let's have a broader conversation about organizing and the culture of what organizing is and how it's evolving in the United States. And to give you some context, um, in Australia, um, there as – well, actually, no, before I say that, obviously COVID has created – a disruption in the way that we live our lives and politics is not exempt from that um, and that means that we have to strategize in ways new ways to try and reach voters and we've sort of touched a bit on that today um, and there's i've just noticed there's a, someone brought a vox article to my attention uh, a couple of weeks ago who sent it through to me said Stephen, what do you think about this and it was sort of talking the debate about you know door knocking is there any place in door for door knocking in mm, in, in a modern yeah, campaign anymore? yeah um, and I just want to get your thoughts on the debate that's going on within the campaign community about these various practices. But before we do that, just to give you the Australian context for the Labor Party mm. here, Field is a relatively recent addition to the political campaign landscape on the centre on the centre left side. Um, it doesn't really happen on the centre right, which I'm glad that that's the case. Um, and its application f across the various geographical areas of the Australian Labor Party has been patchy. Um, some quarters are openly hot. And also I should stress that field just to – some people think field is just making calls and knocking doors. That's sort of the end product. Mm -hmm. um, and so some quarters are openly hostile to that as, a, as, a, as a, an effective way of persuading voters. Um, and some sections of the party think that that's, you know, it's the be all and end all, but it's really about just the numbers. Like I just, I just want to see thousands of doors being knocked and thousands of calls being made. Um, and I've also heard some people in reasonably influential positions within the party saying that we think that fields run its course in its current iteration and we need to look at new ways of doing it. I don't actually know what that means. And I need to find, <laughs> I, need, I need to find out what that means. And I was going to say, uh, what, right. do you, what do you mean by that? But we're in a group, and anyway. Um, yeah. And the problem I see, apart from my own home state of the great state of Victoria, is that across the country, when we're we're doing field, but we're not organising in the mm -hmm. what I would say the sort of the OFA Gantz model of organising, in that. Um, we have yet to get to a stage where we are enabling volunteers to um, uh, in, in increase our capacity by in like enabling their, their leadership um, and getting them to work in teams and in, empowering them um, through, you know, through public narrative and through relationship building um, and shared electoral strategies, all the things that we, you know, that Gantz talks about. In some ways, outside of Victoria, sometimes it, sometimes it can, and I don't want to piss off some of my colleagues here, but sometimes it can feel like, because <laughs> <laughs> so, I do listen, sometimes it can feel like, uh, yeah, he's, make 30 calls, here's a um, slice of pizza, um, and we'll, hope, we'll see you tomorrow night kind of thing. Um, and, I look, and I say that because a lot of my field organisers in Victoria have gone into state and worked on other campaigns and they've come back and said, oh, it's a different experience. Like it's great where the, the direction they're heading, but it does feel different. Um, what is the post Obama field experience like for the left in the United States? Where do you see it going? I know it's a really big com co topic I've just opened up there, but I just want to get a sense of what, <laughs> what are the debates going on in the United States right now on the left when it comes to organizing? Yeah. Well, so, uh, well, I don't, I don't want to frame it as a debate maybe yet. Um, but, but just sort of where, how would I sketch that here? Right. What does that, what does that look like here? I think, um, I think you see different groups really taking the lead in true community organizing, right? So that relationship building and power building and um, distributed decision making. And then you see other groups really just focused on mobilization um, and that much more transactional, let's make phone calls, let's knock doors when that was possible. Um, and which groups are those? So I think it's really the, the issue organizing um, and, and movement types of organizations that are doing the true organizing. So Black Lives Matters movement, lots of different organizations that are a part of that. They 
are absolutely at the forefront in the U.S. right now of true organizing. Um, a lot of the up-and-coming climate um, climate organizing groups are also really doing interesting, innovative things. Um, lots of distributed power and decision-making work there. Kind of the, you know, it's like the the fantasy that we all had of what Obama 2008 was, but not actually. Yeah. It wasn't entirely. Um, political campaigns, candidate campaigns, those are the groups that are transactional. And I think you'll see where where candidates have connections to some of those broader movements or are able to draw on people who are coming out of those movements. Um, their teams will incorporate more of that team building and, and leadership and delegation because that builds a great team that is more effective at doing mobilization. Um, but they're still, they're still pretty focused on, on, you know, the tactics um, that are required to, to turn out voters. Um, yeah. It feels like Sorry, there lost is. My, lost my thought. Yeah. It feels like that it, there is similar experiences then in Australia. That makes me feel a bit better actually. Um, because I think that that, you, you could summarize that in a, the way that you just summarized that there in the United States it can be applied to the experiences that we're finding here in in um, both in community level uh, organizing and electoral level organizing. Um, there is that that mixed bag of well, I, I said it's patchy, right? And it sort of seems to yeah. be the same case in the states. But it makes sense, right? That that a political campaign has a very clear goal and hopefully nobody needs to tell anybody what that goal is. It's for the candidates to win. And, you know, whether that's a 50 plus one or in a multi-party system, you know, maybe, maybe 35% is a win. You still know you're trying to win X number of votes. The goals are clear. I don't need any input from my volunteers about <laughs> what the goal is. Now, how do we, how do we achieve that goal in your neighborhood? well, let's talk about it because mm. you're the expert there, right? Mm. And like, you know, if I'm if I'm good, I'll listen to you as you talk about the language that's most effective and um, really empower you to choose the places and, you know, some of the tactics that you're using to, to reach people like you. But we don't need to have a whole conversation about what my platform is, right? Mm. Um, for an issue organization or a party, actually, I think especially outside the U.S. where parties are kind of more real than they are here. Um, I think there is a, a great place to build true organizing, but I think about it really differently from the campaign, right? There's like your, this is our party. This is, the, this is our internal leadership. These are the people who are helping to make decisions about what are we focusing on and what's most important to our membership. Um, there's a lot of room for traditional Gantt style organizing there. And to the degree that during campaign time, those people go and run the campaign, you know, you've got, you've got that um, interaction. It's funny you say that actually, because in the, my home state of Victoria, our, the, the, the branch, the Victorian branch of the Australian Labor Party is going through a bit of a, shall, how we say, um, there was some controversy there a while back. Um, the administration of the party was handed over to the the national body of the of the Labor Party, um, and it's been asked to sort itself out because we have um, rampant sort of corruption in who is actually a member of the Labor Party here in Victoria, and it's called branch mm. stacking, and it's used as a way to um, pre-select or select candidates to go into Parliament, and they're being um, they're being selected on the basis of uh, members that aren't truly members of the Labor Party. I mean, they are, but they're, you know, they're being mm -hmm. paid for by someone um, and they're only doing it because they've, you know, there's a lot of favours going on and all sorts of stuff. Anyway, Australians, mm -hmm. Australians listening to this podcast right now are laughing at me trying to explain that. But um, what has come out of this um, low point is there is now an enthusiasm amongst the membership of the party to review our party as an organization and how we operate. Um, people are calling for organizational change. People are calling for structural change. People are calling for cultural change. And all of these things are very, very much needed. Um, and I've been working with a 
bunch of people across the party and putting it in a submission that was due just this week. And one of the submission, one of part of the submission was that we said that we think that you know, as you just said before, the Gantz model of organising can apply to all aspects of the way that the party works. How we select our candidates for public office, how we develop policy. It should be an activist based sort of model of policy development, not just ten people sitting in a room writing it themselves, but actually going out into the community, speaking with stakeholders, speaking with community organisations that are in touch with those kinds of communities, and say, right, you know. If you want this type of policy, then let's get organised around this and this is a way of you getting involved in the Labor Party and influencing that policy direction. Um, and obviously traditional organising, which is what we do do in Victoria anyway. Um, and also our brand structure. We have a brand structure that's quite anachronistic. It's the same brand structure that we had when the party was founded in 1891, for God's sake. Like it's, you know, we, it's just, you know, it needs to update. Um, people are now meeting online. People are now meeting on Zoom. For Christ's sake, you and I are having a podcast right now across the other side of the world at different times. Yeah. You know, it's the way we communicate has fundamentally changed. So organising plays an important role in that. And I think this is a great opportunity for the party here in Victoria to use this circuit breaker to embrace organising, not just in our campaign side, but broader in terms of the organisation of the party as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, the, the work that you do between cycles is the hardest to do because there's the least amount of urgency, right? So it's hard to get lots of people involved, but it's the most important. That's what's, that is setting the foundation culturally and from a policy perspective and from a skill base, um, you know, just building your capacity. That's what sets the foundation for everything else that you do. Yeah. Anyway, that was a big ramp by me. Um, second last question. Um, in Australia, as you know, we have compulsory voting. So there's not really an emphasis on doing GOTV or turnout in a canvassing strategy. But obviously in the United States it is. Um, mm -hmm. We spend probably the last, something we do in Victoria anyway, we spend the last eight weeks solely on persuasion. Uh, our our, our um, DVC outreach is just trying to persuade people. Tough tough conversations to have with voters and that's all you're doing and i find it when i go to the states and campaign and it's all turnout they're the greatest conversations you could ever have oh yeah i'm going i'm going tomorrow great oh fantastic you know uh whereas in australia you've got to get it you're getting in the weeds you're having you know real conversations values-based conversations about trying to persuade folks to switch candidates or move from being undecided to come and support your candidate i've read a bunch of studies recently in the u.s there's a, obviously this debate going on about persuasion um, in a campaign they're saying that there's evidence that in primaries where people know less about candidates the persuasion is more effective but in um, a high, high profile presidential campaign where pretty much you know the people at the top of the ticket that persuasion is less effective um, what are your thoughts on the role that persuasion mm -hmm. can, can play going into this particular general election yeah 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 persuasion is so hard um, I it's funny that you mentioned the studies about persuasion in, in down ballot races, right? Where it's so basically there's just less name recognition. And I actually question whether that's actually persuasion or just um, increasing awareness, right? It's essentially voter education. Who are the candidates yeah. <laughs> and what do they stand for? Um, that is a really critical and important part of campaigning, especially um, down ballot. But that's, that is even a step away from true persuasion, which is, um, you know, either we disagree and I'm going to bring you to my side somehow, or um, you haven't made up your mind and I want to bring you to my side. Those are just incredibly difficult, difficult conversations um, to have. And I think, you know, we did a ton of, of this training and work in 2008. Uh, I actually don't have a good sense of how many votes that won us right like how critical was that to to our win i don't know i'm sure some of my colleagues do but um but i remember it being a really critical piece of of what we were doing especially in the primaries right where we actually had a persuasion framework for how you have these difficult conversations and some pretty gnarly talking points and things like that that doesn't happen really nearly as much anymore probably at the primary level it does but but there again it's much more about um education on what what are the policy differences um or personality differences or value differences uh between the different candidates unless um hey you're arguing for 
um, Medicare for all. And actually, I think you should disagree with that and join me on this other side, right? Those conversations happen, but how many votes do they pull across? I, I don't know. Um, you know, persuasion is, we, we talked about relational organizing earlier, and I think actually that is one of the places where we're finding that um, relational organizing is, is much more effective because if you think about in your own life, you are most likely to be persuaded to take a new or differing standpoint by somebody quite close to you, either a close personal connection or somebody who is very similar to you. And so you can relate, you know, based on your shared experiences and, and values. And that's what we focus on when we're training organizers, right, or, yeah. or volunteers, is to tap into those shared values and experiences. But I think what we're seeing this time around is, is much more of a focus also on, okay, you know, talk to the people you know, talk to your actual connections, and try to use some of those same skills to bring them along, because um, outside of those close connections, it's just super hard. Um, last couple of questions, uh, more uh, about looking to the future. Um, where will you be on election night? I have no idea. I don't know. I will probably be in Chicago, which is just really weird. But I will um, definitely be making phone calls and, um, you know, making sure that, that, that people are turning out. But I suspect I won't be going out to one of the states this time. This is like, you I know, it's not looking good. I don't oh, want want to um, sort of um, create any sort of PTSD here, but where were you on election night in 2016? Oh, uh, I was in Vegas, actually. Uh, um, so some of my some of my closest friends, just in general, are friends that I made uh, in in Vegas in 2008. So we went back out in 2016 and did GOTV there. Yeah, um, can you recall moments from that night? <laughs> that stand out like uh, um i think i think they've been obliterated by the past and um large quantities of alcohol um no <laughs> um man you know election day was amazing we had all these incredible conversations with with voters and had the usual like great gotv experience you know driving people to the polls at the very last minute um all of those experiences. So it was it was tough, especially tough, because we came back to um, the house where we were staying, feeling pretty amped, and turn on the TV, you know. But uh, Vegas is on the west coast, so or nearly on the west coast. So we had returns coming in really pretty early. Um, we had planned maybe to go to the to the um, like campaign party in in Vegas, um, but pretty quickly decided against mm. that because. We were real bummed. Yeah, it's funny that uh, well, I mean, you, you, the Democrats won Nevada from memory. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah we yeah. won. Yeah. We won Nevada. Yeah. yeah, and that is, they have an incredibly strong couple of unions. Both the um, all the the um, hotel workers and painters, and it's a really, really, really strong union state. And yeah. they they have a very solid operation. Um, 2016, I was in Brooklyn making calls from the campaign office in well, one of the parts of Brooklyn, I can't remember where it was. And I was so confident yeah. that when I finished making calls at about seven to go meet my friends at a bar, I didn't check the internet to see the results. Cause I just thought that, ah, you know, I'll get to the pub and it'll be a great night. And I'm going to order, I was thinking about, it, I'm going to order wings and what beer I'm going to have. And then when I, you know, walk into the bar mm. and it's, there's an eerie, quiet murmur going on not a kind of a loud cacophony of talking and i've gone oh what's up and looked at the tv and i've gone oh oh that's not good oh oh that's not oh, that's not good either <laughs> what a yeah anyway yeah <laughs> i mean it changed everything right and i had been um, you know, s sort of peripherally involved with with Brexit stuff and with some other races in um, in Europe that I think were kind of precursors to this. To, so, uh, yeah, it was just yet another gut punch. So, and on a high note, two thousand eight, where did you spend election night? In two thousand eight, I was I was also in Vegas, and that time I did go to. Uh, so you know, we were out on the doors until 
I don't remember when the polls closed, either six or seven, um, and then drove straight to the, uh, the, the, the party was at one of the casinos somewhere just off the strip. And, um, it was just really funny. Cause you know, you've got your, your party grandees and these kinds of people in the hotel, and then you've got us grubby, mm. uh, organizers and people who are, who were out there. It was just a funny, funny, uh, group of folks, but, um, yeah, that was pretty awesome. It sounds like you need to get back to Vegas and recreate 2008 for us in 2020, maybe. <laughs> Yeah, you know, this has been an ongoing debate with with my couple of friends, but I think, you know, honestly, we feel pretty confident about the team in Nevada. So it's uh, yeah. we're uh, focusing our energy in in the Midwest, Wisconsin, Michigan. Um, Vegas is a lot more fun, but mm. <laughs> that's really the place to make a difference. Um, do you feel confident uh, on this podcast right now to make any predictions for election day? Or do you know, are you superstitious and perhaps don't want to jinx anything that's in your mind? Yeah, I'm not superstitious, but I just don't feel confident enough to make a prediction. Right. So, so, you know, the thing I've been saying is if everybody who says they want to vote votes and their votes are actually counted, mm. which is a big if, I think we'll win. But those are two big ifs. <laughs> we have a lot of work to do to make sure that happens. We certainly do, and um, it's going to. This story is going to unravel every day, or every morning as I wake up, um, and every day for you. Um, we wish you the best <laughs> of luck, uh, Katie Parsons. Thank you very much for taking time out of your schedule to come and talk to us today. Really, really appreciate it, and it's been great uh, just having a good field chat with someone. Yeah, so much fun, and uh, really exciting to hear what's happening down there as well. So keep me posted. Will do. Good luck. Thanks so much. Bye. 